Ta-da, what is happening out there, my friends, in YouTube land? This is yours truly, Rockin' Dave, the real deal. North Fort Myers, Southwest Florida. Hope everybody's doing well out there. I'm going to kind of wait a little bit until people are able to get in. I know this was kind of put together, well, about 45 minutes ago, really, and uh, because I might not be able to do anything live tonight, which is okay. Um, I might, might be, maybe, might do something live tomorrow at one of the clubs. I was, Deb and I were out with some friends of ours yesterday, and one of the clubs that we used to play at, he just came up to, uh, came up to me and asked me, hey, you know, we're, we're opening up like around 25%, so we might see if, you know, maybe you'd want to come in and, you know, do a performance. He says, I won't be able to pay you that much or if, if, the, if anything at all, maybe for tips. I told him, I says, Paul, don't worry about it, man. He says, we'll, we'll definitely honor this. We'll do this. We'll definitely do this for you. Um, let me talk with Deb. Let me talk with my people. That's Deb. <laughs> and then we'll see we put something together because Paul has always been good to us. Uh, what is happening out there? Six strings and ten fingers. What is happening? Jimmy Biter, what's up, buddy? Yeah, my friend, six strings, ten fingers, right? Or they say eight fingers and two thumbs. <laughs> or no fingers and all thumbs. <laughs> I really appreciate everyone tuning in. And I, I, I just want to say, I appreciate all my subscribers because I can't believe how fast my channel's been growing. And I really appreciate it. So every single one of you guys and gals out there, you totally rock. <laughs> you like that? Huh? <laughs> yeah. How about it, six strings? Yep. Um, I also, before I forget want to remind everybody that tonight it's 10 o'clock Eastern time, 9 o'clock Central time. David Stafford will be going live and with his guests R2R3 Locking Nut and Joe Wench from the Joe Wench Project. So I want to hurry up and get that in, in case I forget to mention that. Plus, I want to uh, mention for anyone who has checked out some of these tutorial videos out there, and then I'm going to get into what the title of this kind of lesson is you know with the, with the blues phrasing and all that uh, but there is a guy out there the great Vanzini what is happening thank you for tuning in my friend I really appreciate this I really really appreciate this there is a guy out there I, I found this channel and I thought I forgot that I have subscribed to it because you know how it is you subscribe to all these channels it's 24 hours in a day you try to watch as much videos as possible and then you know you get you get busy and if you're always rehearsing and practicing you know it's there's only so much, so many hours in a day. But I want to give this guy a shout out because I think he's one of the best instructors that's out there where he simplifies things. Um, now, he's teaching a lot of R&B guitar, but everyone should check it out because, well, I, I, I do like R&B guitar as well. I really do. It's like a form of jazz, you know, and, and blues. Well, R&B stands for rhythm and blues, right? Well, anyways, his name is Carrie. Too Smooth Marshall. That's K, carry with a K, the number two, smooth, and his last name is Marshall. And he, I just missed his live tutorial earlier. And, uh, but he simplifies things. And what I like about what he says, he mentions about how you got to discipline yourself. And when he, when he had that video up, I got to, you know, find the video, what the title was. But he was talking about, you know, dis disciplining yourself as a player. And when you are either laying tracks down or you're playing with, with vocalists or you just happen to play a song that really does not acquire, uh, require a whole lot of guitar tricks and antics, then kind of leave those out. Now, I know that last video I posted up called Check Your, Your Ego. Electric Gypsy Blues, I'm so glad you tuned in, my brother. I really appreciate you tuning in. And thank you so much because I wanted to give you a shout out because... You know what? When you come down to talking about blues, my friends, a lot of you know a lot of people say we got Texas blues, but Chicago is like the 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 the, the world capital known as world capital of blues. There's no doubt about it. And Electric Gypsy Blues, you live there, and you've been going to you know uh, Kingston Mines. Well, you put put putting videos up of you uh, uh you know going to Kingston Mines, and in my book. Even though you play a lot of like the blues rock, you're still a blues player and you're a Chicago blues player, my friend. So, yeah, you're the real deal. You are definitely the real deal. Um, and, of course, 
that's my that's my old stomping ground you know that's that's why I grew up that was 53 53 years of my life oh you're very welcome very very welcome you deserve it man you deserve it well, anyone wants to mention blues you know and we got some youtubers out there now I'm a former Chicagoan but I will always be a Chicagoan because I live down here in Florida but you know I haven't been back in Chicago for almost three years so the people that live in Chicago, you want to hear stories about blues, you talk to the people that live in Chicago. That's how you're going to find out about, about you know, blues, you know, Chicago blues and that. Um, but, so I, I also watched a, a video of, um, of um, Buddy Guy. And, you know, I've seen a couple of these other videos. And let me just lower my volume uh, back here. But I, I've seen a couple of videos, and have you guys noticed that there's all these videos popping up on, you know, how to enhance your blues playing and that? And, you know, in their defense, they are, they do got a lot of good information. They they really do. You know, they're talking about the pentatonic, and then, you know, you know usually everyone learns the pentatonic. Um, sorry about that. You know, in, in A minor pentatonic. It's this shape, you could move it around. You know? And then, you know, and then where the blue note is, the blues. And, you know, and all of that. And it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's good to know that. Okay. It really is. But one thing that I don't see a whole lot of is the the feel that's why I, I titled this video the the art of blues phrasing now first of all the word phrasing it's what what does that mean you know phrasing is really how you express the notes you play you know it's it's really what you're saying oh yeah well you're very welcome you're very welcome electric gypsy blues you know it, it, my, my, in my opinion if anybody wants to learn blues you could check out these videos, and that's fine, you know, with, with lessons and people giving you tips and that. But if you want to learn blues, watch blues videos. I mean, and, and, and you know, watch people like Buddy Guy, B.B. King, you know, Albert Collins, uh, you know, really kind of dig deep. Muddy Waters, find some Sun Seals Blues, the Sun Seals Blues Band. I don't know, Electric Gypsy, if you ever remember the Sun Seals Blues Band. You know, this was in the mid '80s. He'd be playing at you know Kingston Mines and Blues Etc. and Rosas, and there was a few other blues clubs there around the area um, that the name escapes me. But you know, we'd have some up and down Clark Street and all that. Um, but we had you know Sun Seals Blues Band. We had Lefty Diz, who Lefty Diz used to play with the Kinsey Report, which my wife used to. Oh, yeah, I saw him in two. Yeah. At Grand Park, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I can't remember because I from what I understand, he, someone shot him. He died. Or I think it's actually his ex-wife or ex-girlfriend whoever shot him or something. I don't know what the deal was. I can't remember the story. But but we had him, you know, Lefty Diz, who played in um, the Kinsey Report. My wife ran sound for Kinsey Report. She ran sound for um, Lonnie Brooks. We had Eddie... The Chief Clearwater, Little Ed and the Blues Imperials, Big Twist and the Mellow Fellows, Joanna Con Joanne Connor, she's still playing. Um, and God, there's a whole bunch of, of course, Electric Gypsy Blues, you know a whole bunch. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, the Kinseys are playing tonight on, oh, no way, no way, man. I got to check that out. I definitely got to check that out, man. Deb and I, when we before we got married, we were dating. And we went to this place called it used to be called Chances Art. It was in, oh, by Buffalo Grove. Maybe the outskirts of Buffalo Grove. And after it was um, Chances Art, it turned into the Beale Street. You know, B.B. King's Beale Street. So it was all blues there. So Deb and I go there. We sit, you know, front row. And it was just tables and that and in that stage. And there's playing the Kinsey Report. And I kid you guys not, 
They're done playing their song. And as just as they're finishing playing one of their songs, the bass player looks at Deb and points and smiles. And as soon as they're done, he comes down and starts talking because he remembered her. Uh, the sound company that Deb had was called Trans Acoustic Productions. And that became our company when we took it over. And, you know, this is like late 80s, early 90s when she was doing all of that. But it was so cool to see that. But my, my point I'm getting to is for people who want to learn blues, you got to get that feel. And this is what Carrie uh, Too Smooth was talking about. It's, you know, you could know all the notes in the world and everything. And he's a very good teacher. But he did, he did you know, emphasize you got to have feel. And that's basically what phrasing is. is how, do you, how do you play music? How do you approach playing notes? Because I could go up and down. All day long. And you know what? One of these days, I'm going to grab my guitar synthesizer. There's a patch on there that I, I can't just call it like Samurai Blocks. And when you play it with that, that sound, and you play this, do you know this is also known as a Japanese scale? If you go ahead and get a, a Mel Bay scale book, it's going to say Japanese scale, and it's a pentatonic. You can't really hear it if you're thinking blues. But if you think in terms of that, then you can, can kind of hear it. But I just wanted to throw that in real quick. But my point is, that's not going to do much of anything if I don't express something. Um, I'm going to call for a different patch here because I'm going to loop a, a rhythm that me and my friends used to do a lot. And we would do this, <clears throat> excuse me, occasionally at the, the blues jam, the open mic blues jam sessions. And um, I'm not going to really do anything with the drums here. I just wanted to just so you guys could see this. We would do a lot of minor seven chord blues playing, you know, one, four, five. And for those who don't understand one, four, five, um, here it's very simple to understand when it's shown in a simple way, okay? In this case, my first chord I'm playing is A minor. That's my first chord. So I got three chords. Why not? What is happening, my friend? <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. Now, a lot of you people are going to know this. So it really is simple, but sometimes it's so simple, it gets overlooked and it gets like, now we got to complicate things. And I think this is what gets in the way of people actually being able to make music with notes as opposed to theoretically playing, you know, meaning this is supposed to fit that. And then I got the flatted fifth, which is the blue note here or the flatted sixth. You know, that is all that that really is cool. All that stuff is, is great, and I'm not knocking any of it. But as a performer, when you hit that stage, you know, if the thought process is going to get in the way, you got to put the thought process on the back seat, and you got to play with expression. That's why, so how many of you people out there have have been told when you sat in with people that, that are real smart in music theory, how many of you have been told, well, when you play by ear, it's, you know, you really... You really do need to know music theory and, and you know, it's not really, you know, you're, you're good, but, you know, you, you need to know more. Oh, that's one thing. Okay. And in their defense, they're not knocking them. But if someone says, well, yeah, you're really not ready to play out, but, you know, because you don't know a whole lot. Well, let's say you don't know these formulas and all that, but at least you know where your root notes are at. But when you play, you know how to make music. Do you? Do you know the vast majority of blues musicians, especially like back in our day, that we would talk with and jam with and, you know, get in little circles and have talk, you know, discussions about it. I would hear a lot of them say, you know, all that fancy stuff. And I just know at least where these notes are at. I don't know all that stuff, but, you know, I, I, I go for the feeling. I go, I play by ear and I go by the feeling. 
You know, my friends, that is just as important. And as a performer, that is very important when you hit that stage. Because if you cannot express, if you cannot convey a certain feeling as you play, Rick Romanelli, what is happening? Thank you for tuning in, my friend. Then it's not going to sound convincing to the ears of a person that does not understand music theory. You know, it's not going to impress them as much. And I'm telling you, you're going to play in front of a lot more people who don't understand this than people who do. So, you know, you got to understand when you hit that stage, you'll know when you're ready to hit the stage. You're ready to hit that stage when you could play music. <laughs> If you can make a groove, if you can make something feel like it's going to tell a story, you know, right off the bat. And if you see people that you've never met in your life and they start smiling at you and they're giving you the thumbs up, those, those, that's not your friends coming out to support you. Those are strangers. You know what that means? That means you got something there because you're making a connection to people you've never met in your whole life. That's the very first time you've met these people. So they don't know whether your what your background is at all. They just know they're there at that moment and they're feeling that groove or they're feeling the, those notes or they're feeling what you're trying to express. Like uh, 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 when you're playing a, a note, what I call the falling bending notes, you know? And a small, slow vibrato. It kind of expresses sadness or it can express an emotion. You're tr if this is this is what is meant by when you hear the terminology, wow, that, that guitar player, you know, they make the guitar sing or they can make the guitar talk. It's not that they're playing through a talk box or anything like that. They're putting all their expression into those notes. And you watch some of these videos of Buddy Guy playing and he's just bending those notes. <laughs> And he's doing all these little things here. He's expressing an emotion. And that right there is just as important. Now, another guy that I like watching when I can, and, and I think he explains music theory very, very well, is our friend that's on, 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 the, on the live chat right now, Rick Ramanelli, because he's also a performer. And he does it in a way that it's okay if you don't understand this, that, or the other. You know, you'll get you you'll get it. You know, I've seen videos where people would say if there's something that's confusing, turn it off right away. Well, if it's gonna confuse the hell out of you and you're gonna you're gonna have a headache, yeah, you need to get away from it. But then don't disregard it a hundred percent because maybe later down the road when you watch it again, you know, you might say, Well, okay, I think I get it. That's the same thing with me with the formulas. Like, you know, the number system would always screw me up. Always screw me up. Because I don't understand why are you starting with nine and then a sharp nine and then two, three, four, five. And then, you know, what? what is this? It would confuse the hell out of me. So my way is knowing my notes and then we communicate and we get the job done, you know. But now I'm going to show you guys. Okay, so back with the, the one, four, five. So my first chord is A minor. A minor 7, that's my 1. My next chord is D minor 7. And D is the 4th degree from A in the major scale. Here's my major scale. A, B, C sharp, D. 1, 2, 3, 4. My 5th degree in that major scale is E. So, 1, 4, Five. And then I would use this as a passion. Now, I had people say this to me. That's an interesting way of playing blues. Electric Gypsy, thank you so much. I appreciate it, brother. And yeah, but actually the, the most recent was about maybe a year ago and I was with my acoustic guitar and I was just kind of looping. I was playing at this restaurant and um, I was looping that chord progression. And this guy comes up to me when I was done. He says, I never heard blues playing like that. And I said, well, yeah, we used to do have jam sessions, you know, 
He goes, well, do you know any Chicago blues? I says, yeah, that's also another form of Chicago blues. No, 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 Chicago blues, you know. Stuff. I says, well, that's one form. I said, that's the form that everybody associates with. However, growing up at the time that I did, and I don't know, maybe because we had a very strong jazz you know, scene happening at, in the same areas. And, you know, we had the jazz fusion thing growing and every, everybody would borrow styles from everybody else. So Metalhead Hippie, what is happening? Thank you for tuning in, man. I really appreciate it, brother. Um, so with fusion music, fusion is just a blend of different styles. And it could be a little bit jazz. It could be a little bit of funk. You know, and a little bit of R and B. So the blues styles and jam sessions that we would have going on in Chicago at the time, you know, in the early to mid eighties, we would have, you know, these type of groups, um, and there would be minor seventh chords. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and loop a, a minor seventh chord progression, and then I'm gonna do a little playing over it, and then I'm gonna show you. How you could, for people who need to, if they feel they don't know how to bust out of the blues box, what an option you is. And this, you guys might, you might already know this, but for some who don't, this could definitely help. Okay, here we go. So I hope that wasn't too loud or too sloppy or anything like that. But I want to I want to show you something because I've had people ask me this. They would look at what I'm doing down here, right? And I would say, they'd say, Dave, what are you doing right here? Does it? Are you changing keys? Are you changing this? Are you changing that? I said, Well, you know, to be honest with you, I really don't know if it's changing keys. I said, But if you think about it, this right here, ah, uh, thank you, Rick. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. This right here is what I think what you would consider your second form of a C major scale. It's your second octave of C. So here's your middle C on the staff. And we all play our, our C major scale. That's now that's one way of playing it. You know, you can play it up here. C major has no sharps and no flats. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. If I take the second, that octave to it, I have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Now, if I eliminate my B here, and I eliminate my F, and I could... Isn't that, isn't that kind of part of the pentatonic scale? The... If I, okay, so you could see what they call relative keys. You know, A minor is the relative key of C major because there's no sharps and flats. I don't want to confuse anybody, but I think the easiest way is 
is taking a good look at that. You can see where it comes from it, you know. Uh, here's my A minor. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Here's my C major. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. I just expanded on it. That's all. But the easiest way to get through this, look at your chord shapes. Now, when I'm playing uh, um, A minor 7, I'm playing A, I'm playing E, I'm playing G, I'm playing C, E, and A. Pretty cut and dry. You can see where you get, you know, you could do your pentatonic right there, right? So, when I come down here to play my D minor 7, I could still see the shape of a pentatonic scale. But I'm adding this note. My F, which is on the 6th fret on the B string, on the 2nd string. Now, when I'm playing in, within my chord progression, I'm playing my E minor 7. My middle finger now moved up to the 8th fret on the B string to play G. So basically, just on that string alone, with those chords, my finger, my middle finger went from here. And then when I play my A minor, I'm playing back to that note. So I could kind of add this. If that makes sense. This is kind of like what we used to call the lame man's or the, this is the street musician's way of learning how to play. You know, we all went to, uh, we went to Sidewalk University, my friends, honor roll students. And uh, our, our diplomas came in a, a brown paper bag, you know. Because that's how it was for us. Some of us didn't have the money. Metalhead Hippie was at Dave. I have you on the show. Oh, I appreciate it. You know, I gotta, I'll be tuning in. And you know what, Metalhead Hippie? Um, I didn't watch all of what I think was Sunday Live. But I'm going to go through that to see if they pulled some of those cover songs out. Because this has been a problem. And it's going to become even a bigger problem. And for my friends... Who are in the cover bands when the doors open up at the clubs? I just talked to a club owner yesterday and he, you know, offered me to do it like a free gig. And I said, absolutely. And that, and he said, we'll watch with the covers. And and if I do go live, it'll be maybe my versions of some of these covers, but I'm mostly the originals and, and you know, like jam little chord progressions and that. Um, because they're, they're, they're getting aggressive with it. So you have to protect yourself. You know what I mean? And I'll put up some more like original material. But yeah, I uh, yeah, I had to delete uh, them to save the video. Yes. You know what happened to me, Metalhead? I was watching one of the gigs we did at the Blue Monkey down here in Naples. We're, we got back and I'm watching the playback. I'm laying in bed. I'm just, you know, falling asleep. I'm just chilling. I'm watching the playback. And I cannot remember if it was during Stairway to Heaven that I was playing or another song, but as I'm watching, all of a sudden my video went like someone took an old VHS tape in play mode and hit fast forward and it just, and I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then after they got to the end of the song, it said copyright claim and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So it's like, okay, you know, don't, that's what they're up to doing, whatever. Okay, so let me get back to this now. <laughs> oh, yeah, you had four with global shutdowns. Yeah, so I, yep, yep. And you know what? You're right, Metalhead, since you're doing a whole bunch of them. It's not just one video of one cover song. You know, you're on for two hours. And this is what happened to me because we were doing these covers. And I was streaming live. So we got like, I don't know, two and a half hours we were streaming live. However long my battery would last on the phone. And all this stuff was was being broadcasted. And next thing you know, I had the SWAT team. I had uh, I had to take a mortgage out of the house. I had to hire uh, the highest attorney, Anthony Weiner or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just went crazy. And I told my vocalist, Mike. I said, Mike. I shouldn't say my vocalist. The guy was playing with Mike. I said, if you want to do it on your channel, go ahead. But man, I'm just they're just they're, they're hitting me left and right. So. Anyways, I don't want to. I don't want to go off on a tangent because I know that's very easy easy to do. So, 
Now, when I do this, when I'm adding, you know, this is why, here's a good reason why people need to use their pinkies, if they can. If you haven't had, if, if you had a sporting injury, I understand, because when I used to teach heavily, I used to have all kinds of students, man. Retired, retired folks, folks that had kids, that they were te they were learning, they were taking guitar lessons, kids, when the Guitar Heroes video game was popular, special needs students, all walks of life. But then I would have the students, the, and we used to joke with this, so they were really good kids. But you know what I mean, what they call the, the, the teenagers that, what they suffer from, was it LTS, lazy teenager syndrome, right? And they don't want to use the pinky. And they're doing this, that's fine. And they have no sporting injury, so they're good to go. And they're doing this, and that's fine. You know where they would always get the problem with the pinky? Just doing something like this. They're like, Man, I can't get my pinky to, I can't get my pinky to move, but oh, that hurts. Or if this. They complain about the pinky. And the reason why they complain about the pinky, because it never got any exercise. So, but when I'm doing this, I'm actually playing D here, D, pulling off to B, my passing chord, which is E flat, um, minor seven, back to D minor seven. So if right there, I have my index finger is actually is doing a, a pull off from D to B, and then I could do like a half step down to B flat then to A. So that's why I would able to put that in because when I play my C from my D minor seven, I don't know what you call that. I know, I know I'm hammering on C and pulling back off to A. That note's there and that's part of your, your uh, pentatonic scale. So for me and people who like me, who didn't understand what we used to say code talking. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to to um, insult any people who are very wise in music theory. So if if a person can understand music theory, you got a lot of great teachers out there. They serve their purpose. And, you know, especially if you could go to music school or you're in school and you got music as a pro, you know, program, listen to what your teacher is telling you. Try the best that you can to digest that information because it really does serve a purpose. It really does. But as a guitarist, you know how us guitar players are. We just want to play, right? What will definitely help you, no matter what anybody tells you, is if you understand all your notes on that fretboard, If you, I, with the guitar put off to the side, you know, you can lay in bed with your eyes closed. If you could envision that fretboard and know where all your notes are laid out, you're going you're gonna to do good in the rehearsal room when you got to communicate with musicians that don't play guitar, meaning, let's say, a keyboard player. And here's a very good example. Let's say I'm playing what they call a D major ninth. You could do like a bossa nova thing. David Morales, what is happening, man? Let's see. Dave, do you use your right pinky? Excuse me. Oh, how does this work now? See, I don't want to. Do you use your right hand pinky as well when finger picking different, different chain? Oh, uh, you know what I do? Uh, certain things when I'm playing like um like a flamenco style guitar, uh, flamenco bass, and I do what's like with the roscados, you know, like that they call the roscados. I do mine backwards. So if you want to study true flamenco, learn how to do it this way. I, I did it this way because of my ignorance. But when I do a backwards, I actually use my pinky. And it sounds much better on a, a, a nylon string guitar. Trust me on that one. My tremolos, it's my thumb. I am an A. Although I have noticed when I do really fast tremolos, Sometimes my index doesn't catch. My I and A finger could go really quick. And it's just, you know, it's just something that I've developed because I've been uh, self-taught. 
but I would discipline myself and I would try to monitor everything. You know, here's another thing that this guy, uh, Kerry Too Smooth, said. And this is how, what we used to do back in the 80s before we had any money to buy those big ass bulky video cameras with the VHS ta tapes in them, you know. We would take boom boxes and we would record ourselves and we would monitor our progress. But it's audio, it's not video. So, and what we would do to make sure, now when I play classical guitar, the majority of times I'm sitting like this, but I don't want to bust out my jack here, you know. But we would do our practice scales in front of a mirror and we would kind of watch our hand form. And it wasn't to be, we want to be rock stars and we want to say, you know, you get the, the for the hair metal bands, they get the aqua net and they're spraying their hair and then they light their cigarette and their hair catches fire, you know. <laughs> what we were doing was we were monitoring our form. And if whatever, whatever issues we would have, we would be able to see what the problem was. So with today's technology, it is good to videotape yourself and then watch your playback. And wherever you think you have an issue, and you're going to know it because you're going to hear it, you're going to feel it at that moment. Now you could pinpoint what the problem is and then maybe come up with a solution to correct that problem. You know, so that that definitely, definitely helps. But like for the pinky, there's a, a simple, real simple exercise. Do a four finger exercise. And actually, if you could do an exercise like this, and if you could see my fingers. See, they're all down and then move individual. Here you have to release them up. You know that will definitely help. Or what you could do, there is a um, there's an exercise for classical guitars that you plant all four of your fingers, let's say on the G string. Now on a classical guitar, the neck is much wider. So if, you, if it's too hard to do it on the classical or not on the string, just take your electric guitar. This will definitely help. And Let's try this with planting all four fingers, one finger per fret on the G string, and leave these three planted and take your pinky for starters and move your pinky up a string to the D string and then down to the B string. And then if you can, to the A string, make contact, Come back to the G string, then to the E string. Make contact, you know. It is it's very tricky. It can be very, very tricky. That that'll definitely help. And another thing that'll help for bending, string bending, find an area like in this in this region. And bend your third string, you know, with your third finger. And then go to your B string and then bend with your pinky. Now, the trick that a lot of us do, we keep our fingers behind, planted on the string, same string, behind the pinky, and we use our whole hand strength as leverage. So we're going to do it bending up, down. This will help with your phrasing too. And then a nice slide in. And when I did that slide, I kind of let it, I let a little pressure off just slightly to, because I don't want the note to be like loud, you know? See, phrasing is gonna be like a person, like I said before, singing or talking. And when a person talks or they're singing, sometimes it's quiet, sometimes it's loud, because you're emphasizing emotions. Now, when I revert, you know, telling you back to the previous video I put up, that was supposed to be like that. And I really didn't have a chance to really practice that much at all, to lay that down and call, you know, check your ego. But when I'm doing something like um, one of my originals I have called In The End, it's just a nice, subtle, jazzy piece. And it's... And 
not trying to hit the string hard. I'm emphasizing an emotion. It's kind of like a person reflecting on their life or if there's a part in their life where they maybe have uh, troubles in their marriage or their relationship, whatever. Or whatever the case might be, there's a little bit of sadness and they're reflecting. So you're expressing this motion. This is why it's so important. That's why with blues phrasing, what's so nice with blues music, you have this freedom to do this stuff. You do have it in jazz, but there are times it can get a little bit, a, a little bit technical, a little bit analytical, but still you do have the freedom for improvising in jazz, definitely. But with blues, you have the space, you know, so you don't have to feel like you got to put a million notes in. You can if you want, if it's something exciting, you know. When people say blues music, you ever notice you could play blues with a Les Paul, you could play blues with a Fender Strat and a Whammy Bar, you could play blues with the ES35, 335, semi-hollow, you could play with a hollow. You, you, It's like a very, very versatile style of music you could play now well you know now a lot of blues rockers will have all kind of effect pedals you know univibe definitely is one of them electric gypsy blues check out his stuff man he's got that that like that hendrix robin trower univibe vibe going on you know what i mean so which is which is great now with here with this last paw i have coil tapping and out of phase so, I could get that funky, you know. You know? But you don't have to have a Gibson. You could get an Epiphone. You could get even, uh, you know, uh, whatever you could afford. You know, don't don't break the bank. Because I'm going to tell you guys what I used to see back in, the, back in the day. And if Electric Gypsy Blues, if you're still on the chat, maybe you've seen it too, my friend. Oh, they, they're well. You're very welcome, my friend. All right, Rick, you have a great one, brother. You have a great one, brother. I really appreciate you stopping by. Um, if Electric Gypsy Blues is still in the house, I don't know. It's Everything is different now. You know, Rosa's Blues Club was, if it's still there, on Armitage. It used to be between Damon and um, Western Avenue. But we would have all these jam sessions and that. And we'd get together with some of these people. Then there was a place that guy, Sylvester, he had a he had a pawn shop. And God, I wish I could remember exactly. It was somewhere on Diversity Avenue, but more on the west side. And a lot of the blues guys are going and buy their stuff at the pawn shop or the music store. But you see, back then, you'd either, you know, bought a PV amp. Some of the blues guys, if they were really tight on bucks, they weren't always using Gibsons and Victoria amps and Fender amps that were zooped up for them, their signature this. No, some of them were poor, man. Whatever was available at the pawn shop, grab it and try to get a good sound out of it. There used to be a blues magazine called Living Blues. And there was a few articles in there. One of them, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was a picture of him playing a PV Razor guitar. Now, the PV Razor was definitely set up for metal. And it had the, the rail pickups and everything. But there he is sitting there. I think he had a PV Bandit 65 plugged in. And they're sitting in front, you know, on Max, down Maxwell Street. And just jamming some blue stuff. So this perception that you have to have this, you have to have that. And otherwise, it's not going to sound, you know. You, you use what you can use. And you try to get a decent tone out of it for a bluesy sound. You know, you're not going to, you know. I guess you can if you use the old... Um, crank amplifiers that Dimebag Daryl used to play and kind of clean it out a little bit, you know, you know, if they, whatever, you know, you can kind of get it as best as you possible, the, the cleanest sound possible, but what you would do is try to get that tone, but you would always get what, whatever is you could afford and whatever that was available, you see, nowadays, everyone's, you know, their suggestion is you got to do this, you got to do that, and that was not the case back then. The case was, whatever you could afford to get, that's what you played, you know? But, again, with the phrasing, you're sliding, and the way you hit the string, sometimes all it takes is just a few notes. And a muted strum pattern. Now, 
Now, if someone would ask me, Dave, why did you go back in, in, in the, the A minor pentatonic, but why did you go back to the fourth fret on the G? Well, that note is C, that note is B, and if I'm going to play this off of my chord progression with the minor, uh, D minor 7, E minor 7, you know, when I go to E minor 7, that note right there is a B, and it's lower octave, first octave lower to that is here on the fourth fret. So, now I do know that you'll have harmonizing in fourths and fifths and thirds, you know, that all does play into the role. But let's say you just simply don't understand this, this type of lingo. You know, like I said before, all a scale is, is a, a series of notes, no matter if it's Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Lydia, you know, Michelle, and all the other things you want to name them. Now, I'm not, they have those names because a lot of that is from Europe, probably from, you know, Greek area. You know what I mean? Music, music theory and, and terminologies go back centuries. But my point is, if you don't understand that, at least if you could see what the notes, there's notes, like with these chords. A chord is a bunch of notes played all at once. You could strum at once. You could arpeggiate it. What is arpeggiating? You're plucking notes individually. Now, see about my tangents? I, I have a problem with this. It just made it just made me re remember what I was gonna say about this chord right here, this D major seven. I could even be wrong. Maybe that's not a D major seven, but I'll tell you what, that is D. But let's analyze the notes, and I literally had something to this effect happen. So, a guitar player or a bass player, but mostly a guitar player, I could say, dude, it's this chord. It's on it's on the fifth fret, right? Let's say we have a keyboard player, and she happens to be a female. I mean, do you know how stupid this is going to look? make me look? And she asks me what chord you're playing. Dude, it's on the fifth fret. She's going to look at me and say, I'm not a dude, I'm a girl. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I play keyboards. I don't have strings or frets. Uh-oh, now what do I do? And now we sit there, you know, this happens when you're in the rehearsal room because they like the way you play. They want you to do a gig with them in two weeks. You're in the rehearsal room. The rehearsal room's purpose is to go over the material to make sure that everyone jowls and you got your part so that when it's stage time, if, you know, someone over here, the AC, we're, we're down here in Florida, right? And the AC goes out and everyone's sweating like slobs. Well, at least we can still get through the performance. You know, you got to be ready for all things that happen in life because it's not a perfect world. So, during the rehearsal room, you're rehearsing for a performance. That is not the time to go on a 20-minute tangent about if this is a major ninth, does it have an added six? That is important, and I'm not knocking it. But then why did you... And I had this happen to me with this keyboard player. Then why did you want to play with me? I'm not that smart. I'm not, and I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to admit that I don't know something. And if you want to help me, I, I really appreciate it. But let's get together after the performance because you see, we got to get through this performance. The, this, the rehearsal room that we're using, the guy's letting us use it for free. So we got to hurry this up. So he asked me, I said, listen, this, these are the notes I'm playing. D, F sharp, C sharp, and E. Low pitch to high. And I said to him, a low pitch to high. Above, my, my D I'm playing is above middle C on the staff. I always make this very, very um, clear. Because you have middle C here that's on the piano. But you have this middle C on the staff. And it, there's a lot more... Uh, notes that's below this mi this middle C on the piano, and you could get really screwed up. So it's just for me, it's just easier. Middle C on the staff. My D is the first D above. Everything's above middle C on the staff. Oh, okay. He's fumbling in that, and he's he's going like this, and I said, "Man, you got a degree in music, and you can't figure that out." What I just said. It's almost like you don't know your instrument. 
you know. And then we got through it. And the, but the drummer, the drummer's looking at me, and he cannot believe what he's seeing because he knew exactly what I was saying because he's looking at his watch too. And he's like, man, we're running out of time with this. And basically, all I had to do was go over something very, very simple. So my, my point is, yes, as guitar players, it is very, very wise, even if you got to get books. I've got lots of books. When I'm stuck on something, and I used to do this when I was teaching, I whip out the book and I'd say, you know, I'm not too sure, but let's look this up together. Sometimes my students that were taking music theory in high school, they would be right. And then the guy that owned the school, he would say to me, wow, Dave, you know, you're the only teacher I have here that has no college education at all. And I was, but how come you're getting all the students? You've got the most students, but you have no education. How, how does this work? I told him, I says, it's because I spent so much time with my instrument. I know how to play and I know it's layout. And when you have to fast track things, if you don't know one method, know the other method because it's still music theory. You know, I'm going to show this very, very quickly because I'm working on a music program, you know, manuscript lesson program. Um, I told Deb, I said, we'll, we'll contact our attorney to see if we get a copy written only because it, this has happened to me once before with the way I would write things out. I cannot copyright A minor. I did not, I am not the inventor of A minor or C major. I'm not. But my way of teaching was a very easy way, and I have never found this way taught from anybody. And a lot of it is because of my own ignorance. I was my own experiment, you could say. So I wrote things down, and I said to Deb, we're going to patent this and, or you know, copyright it. But if someone tells you, now I have to do it this way because of what's below in the tablature, yeah, it's good. It was a very, very good way. But you see, this is the this is the world I come from. Whether that's a flatted fifth or flatted third, I don't know. But I could tell you what what I see there. I see E F G A B C. So what if it's in quarter notes? But that's what I see. I think that's also part of music theory. So that that's that's the only reason why I say that. You simplify things, and then later on. You find people on YouTube. Rick Ramanali, he's a great guy. He does explain music theory very, very thorough, very good. So does Carrie uh, Too Smooth, who teaches a lot of R&B. You know, I, I do like those ma the minor and major seventh chords. I love to shred. I love metal. I love symphonic metal, power metal. You know, all that stuff. It's good music to me is good music. Okay. So, but what, what the best thing to do is while you're learning all this stuff, never let anyone tell you unless it absolutely is dumbed down, mindless noodling that you can't even remember what the hell you're doing. Well, I'll put it this way. If you're drunk on the couch and the guitar is like this and you're slobbering and you know, you know, and then the fingers are, you know, fumbling, stumbling. Well, that's not too good. But you know when you noodle, you're actually giving your fingers some sort of a workout. And there are going to be times the mind's going to drift, but then there are going to be times the mind's going to come back. When you do your intensive technical practice to, to hone down your chops and your picking exercises and that, I would do it a lot with the metronome and that, but then I would I would also have the time where I could just jam and let myself like what they call free form. Because you see, that's your creative side. The two have got to coexist. Because if it's just one thing, that's what you're gonna be good at, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if it's sounds like a lesson lecture, sounds like it's analytical, well then you give lectures. Now what I'm doing kind of here is almost like that, but I'm trying to combine a little bit of jamming and trying to make, make sense of it as a player, you know, because I was always like that in the middle person, you know, you, cause again, guitar players, we like to play, man. We, you know, you buy the guitar, you buy the effect. You want to play, you know? And you get 
get out of your system, right? And then you kind of, you know, practice. I even practice without the amp. And just work on your chops and your, you know, your playing, whatever, whatever you have the issues with. But never neglect the art of phrasing because that is your music. That, that's what makes it sound musical. And so what if you're not putting in a million notes with sweeping arpeggios? If, if it does not fit, you don't put it in because it's going to sound like a train wreck. It's going to sound way too busy. And there are times I have I record stuff and I look back at it and I'm like, oh, crap, it sounds too busy. And then I play it live and then I kind of pull back a little bit because it's in that moment, you know. Um, that's why more and more you'll see me doing speed bursts, but a lot of mel melodic playing, a lot of melody. Because without those melodies, especially when you're an instrumental guitarist, it's going to sound like a train wreck. It's going to sound like it's too busy, you know. Let me see what's going on here. So, oh, look at, hey, Anthony, what is happening? I, I, uh, your speaker, you're speaking Chinese to me, Dave. Yeah, now, see, okay. Now, Metalhead Hippie. Yeah. Dante, old man Dan, what is happening? Thank you for tuning in. Uh, DB Cisco, thank you for tuning in. And Anthony, I appreciate you, 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 you guys tuning in. Now, okay, Metalhead Hippie, if you're still in this chat, let me ask you and let me ask anybody out there. Does music theory, Jack the Rabbit, what is happening, brother? Thank you for tuning in. Does music theory confuse the hell out of you? And does it get to the point where you bought a theory book and you turned a couple pages and you got the headaches, so you got that big jug of, ex, you know, what was it, uh, Excedrin, extra strength aspirins because you just had a headache? Just like what, what Metalhead Hippie just said, you speak in Chinese to me. It's hard to understand, right? The method that my lessons, when I get this out and going, is going to be so cut and dry. You take your time. Don't rush to it. And I'm not telling people don't learn that, that you know, the number system. Digest it in a way that you can handle it. Hell yeah, it confuses me. Yeah. Because it's almost like there's this code talking. And that's the only thing me and my friends, we used to, we used to joke with each other. Now, we had a, another friend of ours that was going to, um, oh, what college was he going to? Columbia College, downtown Chicago. He was studying jazz guitar, and he was really good, man. I mean, we would sit there, and we'd be playing... I know nothing about theory. See Metalhead? And he'd play. And he, he, had, he had some good chops, you know? We'd be playing. We'd be like, man, Sean, that's awesome. And then he'd stop. And then, but am I doing a flight? I think I'm a flight of third or is it augmented the seventh? I think, guys, I'm doing augmented the seventh. No, 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 wait a minute. It's a flat, it's flat, wait, flat five, sharp in the seventh? Or, or is it flat to seventh, sharp in the fifth? You know, he'd stop playing. He sounded good playing. He'd stop. And then it's like bringing out the tape measure. And, you know, you know, does anybody out there, do you remember back in the day you learned how to drive, you know, driving school in the 70s and the 80s? They tell you you got to park six inches from the curb or three inches from the curb, whatever the hell it was. Who in their right mind today pulls up parallel parks, gets the tape measure out, and measures the front tire and the back tire? I don't think anybody does out there. So this is what I mean. This guy would just get so stuck in the analytical world that he would stop and he sounded great. So, you know, when we're, you know how it is when we're young, you know, we think we got the world by the balls and we find out as we get older, the world has had us by the balls all along. You know what I mean? <laughs> the only theory I know is how chords are constructed. I learned everything else from, and see that, but see, that's great. See, I'm not knocking all of that. It's how you learn it by, if it takes little steps, don't worry about it. Digest any information, you know, playing techniques, the physical aspect of playing, anything it is you learn in life, learn it at a pace that is easy for you to understand because everybody's learning, everyone learns differently. 
And that was always my experience teaching. That's why when I was teaching, I never brought out the book unless, you know, they wanted me to or they brought their books in and we would analyze. And, you know, I was never afraid or ashamed to show my students something I didn't know. Because you can't be. I think that honesty, the door is open because, you know, sometimes you will, as a teacher, you will inspire somebody by also showing them something you don't know. Because then their confidence level, wow, shoots up. You know what I mean? Then they start to realize, geez, this guy puts his pants on one leg at a time like I do, you know? He's not this guitar god that I've been, you know, afraid to, you know, could I stay in the same room with you? Of course you stay in the same room with me. I'm no different than anybody. But my point is, everyone will learn differently, you know? It's when you feel like you got to rush everything. I went to a trade school, and I could tell you how fast, at nighttime. People ask me, would you went to a night school? I said, yeah, what were you studying? And I said, studying to be a knight. <laughs> it was HVAC. And I'll tell you what, if you think music theory's got all these numbers, wait when you gotta when you gotta measure part of your your your, your part of the program for HVAC, heating and air conditioning, is thermodynamics. And you gotta drains of moisture in the air. I can't even see it, but you gotta measure this stuff. And there's ways of doing it, of course. And then when it comes to the electrical section, because when you work on furnaces and AC units, you're going to have electrical problems too. So you better understand Ohm's law, Watt's law, how to take the capacitor, reciprocate. I wish um, Guitar Hack was in the chat here because he also teaches, he teaches electrical at a college. He, he'll know what I'm talking about with that. Or anybody else out there that does, that does this type of work. My point is, I had to do the number thing. I'm like, oh, crap, what did I get myself into? And, of course, you graduate, and then everyone's going to hire you, and you, 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 you rush through things because it's an accelerated program to pass the test. So, likewise, when you learn music theory at these schools, you know, you have um, semesters, and you only have so much time, and you got to cram all this information in. So, of course, it's very easy to forget. It's not like after you graduate... Hopefully you get the job, you know what I mean, to pay off that student loan. But hopefully you get that, that job. Now you don't have pressure anymore. You know, my wife, when I was taking all these classes for HVAC, and she would see I'd get frustrated as all hell. And she would tell me, Deb's very, she's a lot smarter than I am. She's got like three college degrees. She would tell me, Dave. You know Einstein. You heard of Einstein, right? Yeah, that's that really smart dude. Yeah. Einstein, as smart as he was, I guess he couldn't remember his phone number. And there's certain other things he couldn't remember. But he would say, it's not what you could remember at that time. It's where you remember to go to get that information. So that's why I would have, you know, cord books with me and whatever I would need to look up. So if that's a way that you need to do it, go ahead, grab some chord books, and, you know, from time to time, you know, try to remember that as, as best as you can. But don't, as a performer, if you start neglecting the playing, and it sounds like you're clinking and clunking, uh, uh, that's not going to cut it. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget how, how it was told to me when I, Back in 87, 1987, I was in this top 40 band. We'd play all the, out in the, sub, the suburbs of Chicago and all these places. And we would do some places. We would do this place in Lyle, Illinois. Uh, we would be like there six nights doing five to six sets a night. And places in Romeoville, we'd be doing four nighters. And then in... Um, Oswego, we'd be doing two-nighters here. And then Indiana, we were doing a three-nighter there. I mean, you know, we're all over the place. But the drummer, he gave me a cassette tape of 40 songs. I had two weeks to learn all that material, he said, and it's showtime. And I was working full-time downtown Chicago on Wells in Ontario. My boss, we were making blinds, custom-made blinds, you know, vertical blinds and mini blinds and all that. So I told the situation to my boss. He says, well... You could have your headphones on. He said, you're not putting it on. I says, no. I said, Gary, I'll have them on the side of my head. So if you call me, I'll be able to hear. He said, don't worry about it, Dave. Another method of learning music is your listening habits. When you listen to music over and over and over again, 
all these different styles, it kind of gets embedded into your, your body rhythm. You start, you know, you start actually feeling the rhythms. Um, if you're going to do a lot of metal, right, what you want to do, of course, is listen to stuff that has, like, the heavy palm muting. That's why I don't tell people, don't do this, don't do that. Every technique serves a purpose. Always remember that. <laughs> So I would listen to a lot of that Metallica, Maiden, you know, a lot of, well, now we got the symphonic metal, you know, all it is is, you know, power metal. But anyways, I would listen to a lot of that. And then this, this is, this is the situation I was in. I played with the top 40 band at night and I was making good money there. But during the day I was in the metal bands. So during the day I get together with these drummers, we're putting all this stuff together. It was all metal. And then at nighttime I'm doing this stuff. Where I have to play, you know, like soft stuff, you know. Um. Fresh by Cool the Gang. So I had to, again, make sure this was working. You know what I mean? So I put together a tape, this is a long time ago, of all these different styles of music. From Robin Trower to Al Demiola to Segovia, soft classical, to a Barbra Streisand song, The Way We Were, because I had a copy of it before, it was way before I transposed it to classical guitar, to metal, to some Iron Maiden, some Judas Priest, some Black Sabbath, to some Led Zeppelin, you know, all points in between. And I would listen to that over and over and over and over again. And every song was different, a different vibe, a different feel, a different technique. And that right there is very, very healthy for a performer. Because again, when you hit that stage, it's not what you say you know, it's what you show what you could do. That's how they're going to judge you. So that's why I never want to, you know, put down people who don't know music theory. Yeah, rabbit ears are good for listening. <laughs> the only theory I know is, okay, yeah. How chords are constructed, yeah. You know? But once once you get a grasp on that, it's still theory, and then you could kind of branch off. But just remember one thing. Everything comes from a major scale. My mom doesn't come from a major scale. I, I come from my mom, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, this is a cool stream, and I, I like your, your take on this. Oh, thank you, Jack the Rabbit, thank you, you know? It's, be, it's because when I started playing guitar, it was in grade school, 1974. You know, it was a little group lesson, Chicago public schools. <laughs> you know what I mean? And these are the chords we had to learn. Here's your D. And of course, you know, all stiff, you know, because everything's new. And then here's your D. Okay, now we got to switch to C. And of course, the fingers, they fumble and stumble. So they... I didn't even own the guitar. Me and my sister did not own the guitar. We were taking lessons from the same teacher at different times. So our class was on Thursday afternoon. They let us take the guitar home. We'd have it Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we had to bring it back. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I would be practicing all this stuff, you know. I mean, first position chords, you know. I didn't realize that. We're learning this stuff because for December, the Christmas, you know, end of what, before Christmas break, we had assembly hall. What are we practicing to do a performance? You know, so my my first performance literally was 1974. What the hell? I didn't know. I was a kid. It was a lot of fun. And I'm going to tell you what that has taught me. When you're a little kid, you know, you don't look at it like, yeah, I'm going to have the Les Paul, or I'm going to grab the BC Rich Warlock, and I'm going to get all the babes. You know, you're a, you're a kid. You don't think like that, you know? So, I'm sitting there with my friends, and we're having fun, and the audience, there's like 300 people in the audience. They're watching us, and they're having fun. And there was no ego, because you don't understand all this stuff. To me, they're smiling at me, because, I don't know, maybe I, 
we're all having fun. It's not anything that I'm doing. It's just that we're all having fun. So that has always stayed with me. And then you know how it is now, you know, especially in the 80s, especially when, especially when the shred generation was taken off and you play at the metal clubs and everyone's standing there with their leather jackets and the spikes and all that. And they stand by the stage and they watch you or they sit by the stage and look at you. You know what I mean? They give you to look like, oh, you think you're a badass. You think you're okay. I didn't think anything because I would just play whatever it required. And then when I would start with the shredding, they'd get mad. But I was always put down because I had the little PV Special 130 amps. They had, you know, the big Marshalls. I, I didn't have the money, but but they were good players in their own right. But then they'd want to put everyone down because they didn't have this, that, and the other. So, you know, that's another subject for another time. See, Anthony, I'm 14. Start, uh, let's see, started playing a year, a year ago. I'm pretty good. I, let's see, I signed and played guitar at my school concert, and I play, uh, well, good for you, man. Good for you. Anthony, that's, that's great, man. That is fantastic. Let's see. Yeah, you know, Anthony, that'd be a good idea to post on, on YouTube. And you know what? For anybody that is in their beginning stages or, you know, due to they had to take a long period of, you know, time off to raise a family, whatever the case might be. You know, I've said this before about, you know, personally, they could barely bend the string. You know, they're like that. And then because they got a million, you know, subscribers and a million views on YouTube, the next thing, you know, everyone's, you know, hurry, let's give them a signature guitar and yeah. That aspect really is not too good of an idea. It's always good to encourage people, but don't send us the wrong message because some people will start to think, well, why should I have to work hard? I could just stay like this and they'll give me stuff for free. So, you know, you have to, you have to earn things. But now at the same time, never be afraid to post something up. If you're at that level, you can't. When I play left-handed, I can't play at all. I can't sing, that's why I don't sing, and that's my biggest fear, to try to sing in public. Ooh, that ain't happening. So, don't let anyone, you know, tell you you're not good enough. Because if you listen to people that tell you you're not good enough and you constantly listen to it, you'll never make that progress. At one point, we were all not good enough. You know what I mean? So, everyone starts from somewhere, and... Never let anyone tell you if you have what they consider an entry level guitar or starter kit. Never let them make that. Don't let that make you feel that 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 you don't have good gear. If it stays in tune, let me tell you. If it stays in tune, you got good gear. Oh, you love singing. Yeah. Well, see, that's that right there is another talent, Anthony Sight. I can't sing at all. I hate the way my voice sounds. But what I do, I hear the melodies in my head. So if I'm doing any type of a song. Oh, you said something about. Let's see. Uh, okay. Okay. See, at my school concert, I play Richie Valens. I pronounce the name. Richie, yeah, Richie and Elvis Presley. Okay. So I might not be able to do this. I haven't done this in a while, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an example of a vocal melody. Let's hope it doesn't get taken down. Let's see. Falling in love with you, wise men say, you know, Elvis Presley. So that's what how you get around things. I'm going to put this together. I don't know if I can put it, post it or not, but I'm just going to give you a really quick idea. Let me just turn off the uh, the quail tab. <laughs>
if you can't sing, play the vocal melody. And one of the gigs that I have done down here, they were like, yo, David, but you got to sing. No one's going to listen. You got to sing. You got to sing. You got to sing. And we didn't record this. I wish we would have. But I, I, my, uh, Mike took a break and I was playing, I think it was this song. And okay, that's one song you're gonna you're gonna recognize. Uh, you can't help falling in love with you. Yep, you're right, Anthony. Uh, good for you. Record it. Yeah, absolutely, Anthony. Absolutely. Um, so let's hope this doesn't get hit. Okay. So everyone in the in the world knows this song. But have you ever heard it played like as an instrumental without the backing track here? You see what I mean? So there's ways around things. Or when I would do um, instrumental version of um excuse me thrill is gone so this is what i mean by phrasing you know i'm doing a slide in to try to emphasize what in my mind B.B. would sing live. He would always do things a little bit different. You know, he had that, that little, I call it like the sting bend, you know. Now, I would add ad lib to that, you know. Um, but you see, you don't have to have all, no, you know, every single scale, and every single key that's ever been written, it's what you do with what you know. That is how you create music. That is exactly how you create music. Um, I think this lady's name is Noah. She made a, com a comment, a nice comment on my last video, you know. Um, check your ego. And I'm playing, it's all wild, but it's like fusion based, but it's all kind of wild playing in that. And I saw one of her videos and she's playing this very beautiful song. You know, she's playing the chords and she played a little bit of melody, real nice and slow and soft. And she had the words on the bottom. She wasn't really singing it, but man, was it beautiful. When I subscribed to her channel, I told her, I says, that right there, that what you played made me stop and think about my wife and, you know, how much, how much I love her and everything, you know? I mean, it just, see, when music could just, bam, make you stop right there, it doesn't have to be eruption or Yngwie Malmsteen, or if I'm doing something that, you know, that's nice. It just has to impact you positively. You know what I mean? What song do you think I should play? Oh, you know what? I don't know if you're asking me that, Anthony, or if you're, yeah. Well, Anthony, let me ask you this. What song, if let's say if, if you're recording something and you like, feel like okay you're kind of running out of time and you'd like to post something sooner than later you could start with something that you know you could play with your eyes closed in your sleep and that's always a good start you know put your best foot forward they used to say and again do the best that you can as long as it could sound musical don't really so much about technicalities and you know if you do make a little mistake here we all do we all make mistakes Here's another piece of advice. When you're a performer, never, after you made a few mistakes, never uh, never announce the mistakes that you're making because those people are there to have a good time. They're not there for a killjoy, you know? Then later on, yeah, you know, you, you, know you want to fix your mistakes. That's common sense there. But if you get up there and it, it's kind of like you're getting, you're going to propose to the, your, the girl of your dreams, you know? And everyone knows everyone's done things bad in their life and you fix it. Are you going to tell her everything you've ever done bad unless she wants to sit down? Well, here it is, you know. 
But are you going to go on? You go now. She she accepts you. She says yes. I I do. I will. And you just before you say I do at you know at the podium there, you're getting married and you make this big announcement to the whole world. Everything you've ever done wrong. You're like okay. So, well, you're sorry. We get it. It's done and over with. That's the same thing with a performer. I would see these people. They're constantly saying, oh, "I messed this up and I did this wrong." We know that. Don't worry about it. That's why it's called practice. You hone in on your chops. There's variables. See, I look at the big picture because I've done outdoor gigs up in Chicago, outdoor gigs at the Bristol Renaissance Fair and at the Taste of Wisconsin in the hot sun. And then I played up there where it was like fall and it was cold, like 40 degrees and we were outside. And then down here in Florida when it's, you know, July and it's like the sun is on top of you and it's just so hot and sweaty. There's things that's going to happen. I never judge people by that. Never, never. Because everyone, you sometimes you have a bad day. I try to look at, well, okay, they made that mistake. So what? But look how good they're doing. They keep moving forward. So don't let people hold you back. Uh, that will mess you up. Yep, especially if you go back from where you, yes. Oh, Anthony. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Let it, the mu music, music is in motion. You know, if I'm playing this chord progression, if I'm here and I drop my chord here, and if I'm down here for a while and I plug in, I start playing here, but really everybody's down here, it's going to be like a train wreck. And especially if I'm loud or especially if I have to play a melody that is very recognizable. Holy crap, you know. You have to keep flowing with it. Absolutely. You have to keep it moving because it's always in motion, you know. But, and the, the reason, like I said, again, with, with this live stream and this um, uh, thing about with blues, you know, it's it's getting more and more popular again, which is really cool because blues is deemed as an easy style of music to play. You got a 12 bar blues and you're going to do what, one, four, five, or you do a shuffle. <laughs> When I started off with this live chat, it's actually borrowed from, I think, Otis Rush. But I put up a video, I kind of improvised around it, and on one of the uh, one of the videos on my channel, I'm outside playing, and I think it, I titled it Shy Town Blues Rocker or something, because it has that. But that's a style that I would hear back in Chicago. Let's see, Dante. Easy to play, hard to master because it is all about feel. Yes. Old man Dan, Dante, you got it. You nailed it. And you see, this is probably the hardest thing. It can be the hardest thing. It's always, you know, perceived, oh, that's easy. Anyone could play it. Not so easy, especially if somebody... If you if if you've been not doing nothing but sweeping arpeggios and going a million miles a minute, and then all of a sudden, all you have to do is this. And let that note breathe. You're trying to put an expression there. If you're picking every single note. And you try to, you know, it's going to have a different feel. And if the rhythm is not, you know, giving you excitement or, or if you could do a speed burst, but you're a little bit like worn out or you really don't feel it, it's not going to have that same impact. That's why you got to be careful of people telling you, and I'm not knocking them. The advice is about this big. It does have some sort of purpose, but anyone tells you. To play fast, you have to start out playing fast. Well, you have to get control over it. Right, exactly, you know. But if you don't know how to control it, wait when you wait when you have to switch to the next string on an upstroke. I spent a lot of time with that, so I'm able to do it. But there are times when I don't want to play that fast because the expression, it like loses a little bit of, of its authenticity. So there are times and I'll just... 
right on a whole note. To me, it's whatever I, I happen to feel or whatever the, the song would require. But if it's during an imp improv soloing, it's however I feel. It has to sound music. It's got to be like a little instrumental within a song or tell a little bit of a story, you know? So this is where blues could get perceived as it's super easy. It's only a pentatonic. It's only a one, four, five. Yeah, but what about the feel? If you have no feel, it's not going to sound right. Another thing that you could do that um, uh, carry too smooth, I'm glad he mentioned this, is popping the strings, let's say. You're playing with a clean sound, and I'll, I'll go back to the A minor pentatonic. So you're doing something. You could just pop it with, like a bass player would pop the string. You know, pull the string back. That has as much impact emotionally as full-on distortion. Again, it's another it's another technique to have in your arsenal. You know, the more you do have, the more you, you do have to borrow from. But just don't think you got to, like, within next week, because, you know, everyone's home now, within two-week time or whatever, you got to cram all the stuff in. Now, you know, how much of that you're going to actually retain? Be honest with yourself. Play what you really feel in your heart because when you go out there to play it, man, is it gonna, it's going to shine. Randy Tritt, what is happening? Thank you for tuning in, brother. I really appreciate it, man. I got to catch up on some of your, your live streams because I go to get on it. It's not that I'm, I'm not blocked or anything, but I don't know what's going on with YouTube. They'll say, this is inappropriate. Do you want to accept this or do you want this? Or I'm like, what's going on? You know, I'm starting to notice this with other people's videos, you know. They'll start putting this stuff up and they're like, okay, if I go on this, because see, I had a situation happen in my phone and it's from some of these apps and I downloaded some, some apps and it messed up with my maps that I needed for driving and wow, did it screw me up, man. And that's why for a while I I, 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 I didn't go live with, uh, was it Stream Streamlabs or anything? I got rid of all of that stuff because... I had all this crap attached to it. And I think what's going on is they're, they're, they, they'll they tell you this stuff is for free, but they turn around and they sell your information. And next thing you know, you get this stuff popping up on your on your phone. And it's like, hey, I didn't order this and I didn't ask for this. What's going on? See, and then if you're any type of a job or you're teaching or anything around kids and you got stuff that could be deemed inappropriate, uh-oh, you know what I mean? Now it's like, you know, it's it's bad news, man. It's bad, bad news. It could really screw a person up. So I don't know what's going on. I've never seen anything that you've ever said, Randy, that was inappropriate. So I don't know what's happening. I noticed with well, Jimmy Bruno is a great jazz guitarist. And Jimmy Bruno tells it like it is because I think the music industry tried to screw him over, which is a crying shame. A great guitar player like that with all those years all those decades of experience and they want to like piss all over him really that's why he that's why he latches out i know rick Romanelli, you know about jimmy bruno but i went to check out one of his videos all it was was you know i guess the five finger method and he says it's not the cage system it's playing this next thing you know there's a little notification that came in my phone how would you rate this is this appropriate would you deem uh, how many stars would you get i'm like what in the hell is going on? You know, so that's why I try to stay away from politics, stay away from the swear. And sometimes I'll swear a little here and there. But I try to stay away from all of that because I don't want, I'm a guitar player. I'm not a doctor. I don't even play a doctor at a show. I'm not an actor. This is what I do. And you know what I mean? Uh, so, yeah, Ranger, I've had a few people tell me the same. Yeah, I don't understand what it is. And it's not, like I said, it's not anything on your end. I think what happens is, is with all that's been going on, everyone, they're, they're like, everybody's under the spyglass. And especially with the cover songs. And, uh, you know, they send people out to the clubs. And I know I've got a couple of friends that, um, with, with, uh, with the, the cover bands and, um, I've seen a, 
a, a, a part of a live chat. One guy was debating, well, I know about, do I play originals or I play covers, you know, and he does whatever he wants and everyone could do what they want. Just keep in mind, whatever it is you post, they could take it down. Or if you're in a club, the club owner could say, because the club owner is going to get the fine. And the club owner could say, look, I cannot have you play this music anymore because I'm getting in trouble and I got to pay these fines. And again, it's, I had a few club owners down here already now tell me it's a $5,000 annual fee they got to pay to get the rights to play cover songs. And you see, this is the result with people wanting free stuff. Nothing's free. They're, if they're losing money on, on the front end, they're going to get you on the back end. And they're going to find a way to get you. And once they do, you, fair use, be very careful of this term fair use. I know I'm kind of like babbling on a little bit longer than what I wanted to, guys. But be very, very care, uh, careful. Yep. In San Francisco, no covers unless they pay ASCAP. Yep. Now, I'm very fortunate that Deb has got me registered with my originals with uh, BMI and ASCAP and their CSAC. So she takes care of all that. You know, so we tell these club owners, look, I legally we could play our music because we own those rights and we're registered. So don't you don't have to worry. So don't hit the panic button. Just sound good. Um, that's that's the main thing. But uh, you know, I, I told a couple of my friends to say, you know, these club owners are re they're really rethinking this. Yeah, back in days, should I record with my phone? You know what? I'm recording with my phone right now. Was that music too loud or distorted? You know what you could do? If if you record with your phone, and Joe Wentz, great guy, the Joe Wentz Project, he told me that uh, you could record a sample, be, and, and before you post it, you could put it as uh, a private, and then you could review it. What you could do, you could record, oh, thank you. It's not that at all. So that's the same thing I'm doing. Yeah, five by five. Yeah, yeah, five by five. Yeah, metalhead hippie, um, with with the with the copyrights, you know, um, there. Yeah, that's what this one club owner said. It's it's, that's how much it's costing, and they already have overhead, and they're like, okay, we don't want. We were just so sick of dealing with all this. Okay, what amp do you have? What I am using right now, I am using a Digitech RP360 XP. I have the output set to mixer. I've got it run through a loop pedal. And it's run into a Roland a BA330. I record all my stuff with the phone. It's, yeah, you don't need anything super fancy. I know a lot of people say, you know, with all this advice, if you want to make your channel grow, you got to do this, that, and the other. Best advice, be authentic. Because you spend all this money on all this crap, and then all of a sudden, uh-oh, well, no one's going to watch your video because you got version one. You need to download version two now. All of a sudden, things change. Now you gotta, no, just be authentic. Don't break the bank if you don't have to. You know what I mean? Let's see. Yeah, no, you're welcome, Anthony. You're welcome. And again, like I said, be be be, be authentic. And if it's something that you feel strong, you know, as a performer, you're not going to please anybody, everybody all the time. Even if you're playing everyone's favorite song, you this is not that's that that's not going to happen. But as a performer. Your job as a performer is if you look like you're having a good time, you might inspire someone else to join your party. And I've had I've had this happen to me numerous times where people would say one of you know many things they would say, dude, there's hardly anybody here, but when you're playing, you look you you look like you're having fun and you're playing like it's a packed house. You know? Or they would say, I'm not really big into that music. I'm not a big fan, but I had fun watching you play because you look like you had fun. There's nothing more of a killjoy that, you know, I'm going to put the phone up here. You know, you got, you got people that are, they're playing a cover song and they're doing one of these numbers and I'm not trying to knock anybody, but you've seen this, you know, they're like this. And then someone gives you, oh yeah, hi, yeah. And then you kind of go like that. And then they walk away, and then you're back to, you know, you, you, you're not convincing. 
You look like you can't stand that song you're playing. And then they say, yeah, but I got to play because everybody wants to hear. Well, one person liked it, and everyone else at the bar, they could give a damn what the hell you're playing. They, they don't even like that song. You cannot possibly guess every time someone walks in the room. It's nice to be able to read the audience. That does help. But you are not going to please every single person that walks in the room. <laughs> in the room you know? But if you look like you're enjoying yourself, and that is not being egotistical, that is not being, you You only play what you want to play. See, your job is to play what people want to hear. Well, you know what I do with people that are like that? I take my break and then here's, let's, let's play the jukebox. You can play whatever it is you want. You know what I mean? And I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I cannot be the phony bony either, you know? Buck Lester, what's happening? Uh, I'm late to the stream. Just hit the notification. Oh, I'm sorry about that, man. No, no. I, uh, yeah, let's see. I'm a, good people are talking with each other. It's good. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, again, authenticity. And like what Metalhead Hippie had said earlier on, uh, he put up a video earlier about, you know, be nice if people would send more originals, you know. Even if it's just a jam session, you know, if it sounds good, maybe the super dude with the, I call, I used to say this, you know, the super dude with the Mr. Spock ears, he's the scout. He's the one that's going to charge you 100 to 150 bucks for you to play one of your songs. And then maybe he'll like it and maybe he'll give you a shout out on his channel or maybe he'll, you know, tell somebody about you, you know. Okay, he's entitled to his opinion. Or she's entitled to her opinion. Or whatever the case might be. And at the same time, give them the respect if they if they worked all that and they have that going on and that's their thing. All right, respect them, that's fine. But does it mean that they shouldn't respect you? You know? My point is, is that you, you do have to please yourself in order to please make it look like you're enjoying yourself. I know that almost sounds very egotistical, but again, if you look like a killjoy and like a, you know, I can't stand this song. I don't even want to be here. Oh, and those people walk in and they see the sour puss look and everything. Oh, I'm like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? You know, geez, I'm supposed to have a good time. <laughs> How could I have a good time? He looks, he looks miserable. <laughs> you know what I mean? So again, it's, you know, you have to. Uh, yeah, play like you're playing for a million. Yeah, that's exactly it. I would have, oh, no, you're all right, Anthony. You're all right, brother. You're all right, man. Um, I would have people come up to Deb after performance or they'd come up to me and they'd say, man, what are you doing here? You should be this, you should be that, you should this. And I I really appreciate them liking me and, and all of that. I really do. But, you know, there is another side of music that it's just, like anything, anything where people could get success and fame, there's bias. And, you know, you just learn how to work around all of that. Uh, again, as far as from the business point of music, the secret ingredient really is money. If you could fund your projects, your own, these people can't buy you. And then if they can't buy you, then they don't own you. And then they can't tell you anything because they're not pulling money out of their pocket. You're pulling it out of your pocket, you know. And uh, then when I was getting to the point where people with these Mr. Spock years, I'm going to tell you this, the people who I've always valued, I'll show respect to them, but the people who I value are the people who would buy my product, they'd come to my shows, they'd support me. They get the first priority. Because they're the ones that's actually helping me out. You know what I mean? The person that can have a million bucks and all the advice in the world, but if he's never done anything for me to help me, his advice may be fine, but I, why should I drop everything and, you know, now all of a sudden this isn't good enough. I have to buy the, the, um, the was it the R9, the 59 Les Paul? Well, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with the Ivans? Nope, 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 nope. You can't, you can't use this. You can't use that. Nope, nope. No one's going to listen to you. No one's going to like you. Really? Did you, did you ask everybody 
out there in the audience that probably look at you like, I don't know, oh, that's his Gibson? No, I don't know. Sounds good to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I really appreciate that metalhead hippie. I really do, you know? I, I appreciate his honesty because through their honesty, that helps me grow as not only as a musician, but also as a, as a human being, as a person. So I guess my, my approach to everything has always been simplicity and look at things. And yeah, I make mistakes and boy, I, boy, I was wrong on that, that advice, you know, if someone's brought brings my attention. Thanks. I appreciate it. You know? Um, but yeah, you get some of these people out there that they're, you could tell what their, what their motive is. And trust me, and I'm sure a lot of you are the same way. It, it happens over experience just with life in general. You don't have to be a guitar player. Just live long enough to deal with people and you can start to spot what their motive is, you know? And I always try to show them, you know, respect and but respect's a two way street. You know, you can't make yourself look like a chump and a fool and a a sucker because they wanna tell you something. All they wanna do is to do the money grab, you know, have you spend money and give you empty hopes and empty dreams, you know? And that's what happened with a lot of the blues artists back in the, back in the day, you know, being the topic of blues phrasing. And it's, it's good to see people continue on with the music. Now, there's a video I saw today, I think it was like maybe four years old already, where, you know, Buddy Guy was saying, you know, it, he wants to see the young the younger generation keep the blues alive because all of his friends who had passed away told him, he says, Hey, if I go before you, at least keep this music alive. Let's keep this going. Let's keep it alive. So now buddy is up there in his, his years and he's basically saying the same thing. And the great, the great thing with YouTube, whether it's, blues, whether it's jazz, jazz fusion, classical guitar, flamenco guitar, every style of music, especially the styles of music that are deemed unpopular in, in mainstream media, the good thing with YouTube, it keeps it alive. It really does keep things alive. And the young folks like Anthony, he's playing an Elvis Presley song. He's being exposed to a generation of the 50s, you know, the, the musicianship back then and, you know, before people had the toys to play with, that technology has, you know, enabled us to do all these things. You know, that's how it was back then. Although I'll tell you what, Les Paul, who this is named after, Les Paul and Mary Ford, I need to do the research. But someone, a few people told me, all those videos and those TV shows that they would do was in the basement of their house, or a lot of them were, because Les Paul was also an, a great inventor. So he actually, if you think about it, started the first like MTV or YouTube. You know, if you think about it, everything, every idea we see now, it could be traced back from somewhere. You know what I mean? And likewise with with uh, with blues music, blues. I think blues could have been a stem from jazz, which jazz was a stem, the big band jazz era, a stem from classical music with an orchestra. And then it just didn't have a groove where other musicians who could improvise and they could feel dance, they could feel this, they could feel that, things would groove and it would alter just then enough to start a new style of music, a, a new genre of music. And likewise with blues, would be able to come out from either jazz, or maybe it was a parallel, the same time, you know, guitar players coming up and telling stories of their heartache, how hard life was for them. And they would sing it out, or they would play it out. You know, flamenco guitar in Spain, even though it sounds nothing like blues, but that is that country's blues, like poor man's music, you know, and you had the gypsy jazz and people who they couldn't afford the elaborate lifestyle. They couldn't afford things. So they were considered the peasants. So they're out, you know, out in the cold, you know, you're not good enough to be in with the clickety click in crowd. But 
the thing is, they were very, very happy people inside. So they would find ways to celebrate amongst themselves. And this is how things would constantly grow and grow and grow and grow. As generations passed on, so would the stories of their life and their music and everything would pass on, come on from another generation. And with, um, I mentioned this before, with tablature, tablature, I, the first time I saw tablature was in a guitar magazine in 1983, but with my studies with Guitar Foundation and through Renaissance music, you had, you had early tablature in the 1400s, probably even before that. And the reason being, musicians were back in Europe were hired by either the king and queen or the pope. And if they were accepted into that circle of, of a clientele, then whatever they need, they would take care of, you know, a little bit of education here, a little bit of this. But the peasants, sorry, you're on your own. So that was their way of communicating with each other. And there is music like this. I'm going to do it really quick, and I know I'm kind of going on. But this, Romanza. If you look up, especially some of the um, copies of its original form, it's going to title, you know how it says Romanza by, let's say, Metalhead Hippie or by Dave Byron or whatever. Romanza, anonymous. There's a few other pieces of music I have in the Renaissance period and the Baroque period and some of the Celtic. Anonymous, anonymous. And why did these people want to put their name to something beautiful like that. Why? Because they were being employed and hired by either the king and queen or the pope, and they were told what to play, what not to play. You see what I mean? No different than a lot of blues musicians. You got to play this. You got to do this. I'm flipping the bill. I'm calling the shots. You know, the old saying about, uh, was it the, the golden rule in business? He who has the gold money makes the rules. What's well, my son? I'm sorry. I'm the one flipping the bill. You either like it, you're in or you're out. Sorry, I get someone else. You know what I mean? That's how it was. So people would write this stuff, release it, sheet music, you know, and don't say I read. I don't want to put my name to it. I don't want to get in trouble. Isn't that something? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I will be playing that in an upcoming guitar demo. Yeah, you know, it sounds much better on a nylon string, trust me. Um, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just the steel string. It just has a pinging sound, even though I know I've got this. Let's see if I even, you know, when I think of a finger picking on a steel string or like on electric guitar, I think, you know. Or, you know, jazzy, mellow stuff. It's hard for me to... Like this. That pinging, I don't know what it is, that like holds me back, you know? That's my handicap. When I play it on a nylon string, well, maybe I'll grab the nylon string real quick before I, I call it a day here with this. Um, you're going to see what I mean now because the nylon string just has that tone. And I won't do it on my Cordoba. I'll do it on the Yamaha. I got my Cordoba in the case. But see, it's much different. Much, much different. Now, this is why I use my pinky on my right hand. But it's like a... has that tone.
So it's different. You know, it's much different. And then what, you know, people say, you can't play a nylon string with a pick. Well, or like the flamenco playing. But you see, it's a different style. It has a different sound, different tone. That's all. So, <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Uh, but anyways, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. And, and like I said, learn as much as you can out there. And whatever you feel that's like, okay, it's giving you a little bit of a headache and you get a break from it. It's always, always healthy to take a break from something, come back to it, and do it in the steps that make sense to you. Because the reality is, when people want to make it a contest, unless you're going to join a contest, that's totally different, you know. Or if you're in school or something, you have to take tests. But on your own, without all that, when they go home at the end of the day, all the gear that you have is a memory. You know what I mean? Because they have their own life and their own set of issues or whatever. Their life they have to look at next. It's like you have your own things. And everybody learns at their own pace. If every played this, if everyone played the same way, the same style, it would be very, very stale and very boring, you know. Um, that that's that's what that's what it is, you know. And again, with with the blues phrasing, you could give you could give the same guitar that someone plays to someone else. They could play the exact same thing with the exact same guitar, and they're going to play it slightly different. That's the magic of it. It's it's really a great style of music to do free form in all aspects, you know. So, my friends, I really appreciate your support and your, your tuning in. And, geez, it's almost, what, two hours now? Holy crap. I really appreciate your time and that. So, again, tonight is um, David Stafford's live stream. Uh, Sunday, we have Metalhead Hippie. He's going to be spotlighting. I think he's got, uh, I guess, uh, Black Savage. So, we'll be uh, tuning in on, you know, Metalhead Hippie's. Um, you know, and give the thumbs up and support the guitar community. Let's keep everyone, you know, going. And do as much as you can. And when people cannot get on my channel all the time, don't don't worry. Because, you know, how many channels are out there and there's only 24 hours in a day. I never take anything offensive or, or anything like that. Because, again, it's 24 hours in a day, you know. Um, but, yeah, if you like this, I appreciate all, all again, everything, you know, you're supporting that. And um, take your time learning. You know, music lasts a lifetime. Enjoy it, right? Anyways, my friends, stay safe out there. You stay true, rock on, and God bless you. Thank you for watching. Take care.